Hey, good afternoon. It's good to see you all. Uh, one last time, we had a very long and intense uh, semester full of wonderful presentations. And uh, today is the last uh, in our lecture series on creativity on practice for LNS 25, um, a special course to introduce people to the range of uh, creative activities in uh, the University of California. And uh, we could do this uh, course for another two or three years. There's so many more speakers that we didn't have a chance to introduce, but today our guest speaker is going to be Carmina Cella, who's going to, uh, who's a composer and a mathematician, and who's going to speak about uh, finding his creative voice and uh, uh, about temporal structures, which will be uh, the basis for your final project, uh, creating a, a, a sonic atmosphere, which I'm really looking forward to listening to next week. So um, our slide here is showing, in fact, one of the installations of Carmina Cellas at uh, um, their uh, lab in uh, Sinmat, the Center for New Acoustic and Music uh, Technology uh, over at Art Street. It's part of campus, but it's not on campus. And it's a wonderful building full of magical tools and systems to generate sounds unheard before and also other ones that have been heard before and time honored. And uh, here's a setup that shows um, uh, two drums connected to each other through their vibrations. And uh, Carmen is going to explain more exactly what this, is, what this is all about. But I think this image is very evocative because it shows how sometimes we have to build all kinds of things in order to really bring our voice forward. Uh, little systems that help us amplify our voice, I guess. And um, <clears throat> there's a technical component to that to make it louder, but there's also a emotional component to that that's very important. And I recently was looking at Omicron data concerning the virus and looking at how people respond to data. There's so many facts in the world that facts in the world that we respond to emotionally. And so just having the facts is not enough because uh, when we have the facts, we have to interpret them. And when we interpret the facts, then we um, are really doing something creative. A creative act is to figure out what the meaning of something is. And, and that creative act, of course, is loaded with emotions and with, with uh, uh, expectations, cultural expectations and biases. And even a simple fact as looking at uh, the spread of a virus um, is loaded with um, a potential to understand things clearly or to misunderstand things clearly. And I'm just baffled by how many how many misinterpretations of, of, of incoming data we get, even though uh, we have uh, a lot of evidence to the contrary. So in particular, you know, how, how in, from, from the Omicron information that, that we had, we concluded first that, oh, we have to blow, um, stop all flights from South Africa, but it turned out that was not really effective and uh, that wasn't really the problem. So we're trying to sort of respond emotionally to, to things and sometimes the emotions aren't quite right. So um, getting the right emotional response is a deep uh, and very important aspect of living in your living your life in a creative way uh, because your emotions are something you create you cultivate and um, and finding the right way to respond to something is is fundamentally creative so <clears throat> when we do this kind of exercises where we look at the world and we try to reinterpret it or we rewrite a poem or we listen for a sound it's not just about some abstract exercise it really is about how do we interpret the world in the most meaningful way possible? And uh, there's when we interpret it wrong, then we take actions that are not helpful. And uh, that's one thing to look out for. So um, <clears throat> as you're preparing for your exam, I'd like you to think about the lectures we had in those terms, like not in terms of just knowledge and facts, but in terms of how people made you feel. So if you look at this list of speakers that we've had, you know, starting with, um, uh, um, with Grace, o Grace O'Connell, who talked about uh, the materials that she's growing in her lab that are going inside our, our tissues, between our bones, and uh, say Lisa Wymore and how she was dancing on stage with a whole group of dancers, Vikram and how he was talking about his ink pen that he had as a student in school in India, and Alex and her forms and the poets, the poems that came out of the forms, and Marty and her discussions about what makes sense, what is useful information. Each of these speakers they gave us information but they also gave us some kind of feelings and when you review for this exam i want you to be able to look at this image and say oh yeah this one made me feel this way this one made me feel that way and so forth and that'll give you uh, a really good sense of how to prepare for this exam where we'll ask questions about how you made sense of what happened here not is it right or is it wrong but what sense did it make to you so it's not an exam where you can be 
getting a good grade by getting it right, quote unquote, but um, by getting it, um, by telling me or telling us, the GSIs and me, how, how things made sense to you. And uh, so that's what it's all about, really, making sense of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our speaker today, uh, Carmina Cella. And uh, so I, I um, very honored to be able to work with Carmina in various uh, uh, capacities, including thinking about a new media masters that we're developing together with a group of grad students and uh, asking ourselves, well, what kind of education do we need to give people on a master's level in order to help them make sense of the world? Um, with uh, with media and technology, with art and technology. And so that's been a wonderful experience to go through. Um, Carmen is from Italy and he studied in um, the Conservatory of, Mu Conservatory of Music. First, he got a diploma in piano in 1998. And this is quite interesting because it, you can see that uh, his education is extremely deep. So if you want to be interdisciplinary, you have to study two things, not one. And that means that you actually have to spend decades studying music and decades studying math in this case in order to really get that synthesis that you're looking for and so that's exactly what he did he got a diploma in piano in 1998 and computer music in 2002 composition 2003 and then at the phd level uh, he got a phd in composition in 2007 in rome and then he got a second phd in math in 2011 and then he was uh, ready to embark on his career, um, which is really a synthesis of the two topics of math and music in various different ways. And one of his signature pieces uh, that was completed in 2013 was called Reflet de l'Ombre or Reflections of the Shadow. And uh, since 2019, uh, he's an assistant professor at Sinmat Berkeley, and we're so lucky to have him. So we're completing this lecture series, which I mentioned last time, which com com began with our body tissues. We will we'll complete this lecture series with the most abstract uh, kind of experience, which is just hearing the sound of something moving. Um, while these experiments represent perhaps the most abstract form of creativity, they nevertheless have the potential to resonate with our innermost tissues and with our outermost worries, all the way from you know the core of our bones to the viruses in the world, and therefore allow us to feel in ways we never felt before. With that, please join me in welcoming Carmina Cella. So make us feel like we never felt before. <laughs> Thanks so much, Greg. Thanks for this nice introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And um, what I just wanted to show you some of my work and a little bit of my world, so to speak. Uh, so the title is New Sounds. I'm not sure about the title either. So um, let's see if we will find any new sound today, OK? Oh, I, I'll, I'll try to give you a, a brief history of everything in one hour or something. So uh, let's see if it works. Uh, I start from my family, OK? So this is my mom, and she loves Beethoven. And she loves his music, and she uh, I, I'll talk about that in a minute, OK? So I, I'm saying that be because of a reason. And then uh, my father actually didn't care, and he didn't really like music. And he doesn't like music today. Uh, but I love them. And then uh, this is me. Um, and as Greg mentioned, um, I, I am a kind of in between a couple of things, uh, musical composition being the primary aim of my research. But I also studied math, and uh, I somehow put the things together uh, with creative computing. Um, so in other words, uh, if I have to kind of uh, describe my work in a nutshell, I would say the question comes from music, the modeling comes from math, and the solution comes from computers, or something like that. So, and then they're in feedback, so it, it, everything affects everything else. So basically, that's my, that's my uh, uh, kind of uh, space for the moment. Um, let me give you some history uh, in terms of geography. So I, I, as Greg mentioned, I was born in Italy. Uh, there I was eating pasta and I learned orchestration. And cooking pasta and orchestrating is somehow similar, right? So you put some of it, some of that, and then you have kind of a new recipe. And maybe even if you have two things that are independently good, they, you put them together and they are not good together. So that's Nutella and mayonnaise, for example, right? So. Uh, and then, so, well, I, I learned how to uh, orchestrate. That was the main thing, I would say, for those years. And then I moved to France. And then I moved to France, and I started eating camembert. And there, I would say, I started uh, organizing 
my thoughts and understanding the importance of structure and the importance of time and how much time affects the structure. And there I I'm somehow connected my math work with my music work. And as Greg mentioned in 2013, um, I composed this piece that I will present in a minute uh, called Raphael de l'Ombre, in which I basically put together the research from my PhD in math with the research from my PhD in music. And it was kind of the first real moment in my life in which I, I've seen the thing happening for real. And then since then, I didn't stop. Uh, then I moved to the US, right? And then, well, you know uh, what's, what's that. So you put everything together here, right? So we have a bunch of things that are very diverse, very rich, and, and that's new. And I don't know how this will go and where this will bring me. But for the moment, I am at CENMAT, the Center for New Music and Other Technology here at Berkeley. It's a very diverse place uh, that is a very, has an, a very nice history, like he was founded around the 80s. And uh, there is a lot of research that is interdisciplinary, this strange world today. Like, so we have musicians, mathematicians, computer scientists, psychologists, and historians, and whatever. So it's a really a nice, diverse place. So please come visit us when you can. Uh, so uh, the talk is uh, called New Sounds. So uh, I figured I would, I, I would start with the sounds that shape my life. Okay, so um, that's maybe the best way for me to present my word. And so the first sound is uh, my mom, right? So Beethoven. So um, um, this is a, a manuscript and there is a, you know, some sort of tomato sauce on, on, on the page. That's real, it's not a joke. And so uh, this is the ninth symphony. I'd like to play for you the, the beginning of this symphony, like a few 30, 40 seconds of the thing. I'll play that twice because I want to point out something, okay? Let's do it. Stop here. So, yeah, I know, coitus interruptus, right? Yes. So, what happens is that, in my opinion, here, these two, so there are like, there is a beginning moment of this symphony that is very different from the kind of the second part of these 30 seconds, so to speak. The first part is there, there are no melodies, there are no real chords, there are no real rhythms. It's just somehow a sound. On the other hand, in the second part, there is a theme, there is a melody uh, that is very, you know, uh, um, strong, so to speak, and, and, and it works on a different kind of uh, 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 perceptual level. Let's play it again. So the first, I, I, I would say 15 seconds is just about sound, and the last 15 seconds is about melodies, harmonies, and rhythm. Okay, let's see if, it's, if, if you agree with that. to me that we were like underwater and at some point we, we, we surfed somehow and then we, we now see things and hear things in a different way. This was uh, kind of something going uh, all day long in, when I was a kid. You know, my mother was used to play these symphonies uh, like basically 24 seven. And so I was <laughs> immersed in this type of uh, music and something, you know, happened in my mind, right? So, but then a few years later when I was six, I, I met this guy here, the Commodore 64. And I started, uh, you know, I, I developed a, some sort of interest with, to this object. 
And I started writing code. And the first thing I wanted to do was to make music with these, uh, with these code. And so let me play a, a few examples. And then, so you will see that there is some code that corresponds to some sounds. So what happens here is that the system generates a sequence of characters, a stream of characters. Then you put these, you play them with the speakers and you get these kind of rhythms or sounds. I was hooked. It was incredible for me. Like you, you can really, you can generate numbers and this would generate sounds. And there is a kind of this type of connection. So I was a kid, I was used to pass a few hours per day before going to school writing code for Commodore 64. My mother was not okay with that. She would prefer much more that I would listen to Beethoven instead, right? So, and I actually kept doing that. And I must say, I never stopped till today. I, I even found a job doing that, you know? So it's, it's, it's crazy. So at the same time, I was interested in composing, right? So I, this is my fir very first piece. It's called Trillo Allegro. And uh, I composed when I was six. six and you see there is a, mist a, a, a few mistakes, okay? For example, this, this bar, you're supposed to have four, four, and then there are five. And this was some of my inspiration for the, you know, the next years. Can we put more into less? And this was, can we use computers to figure out how we put more into less? How we pack things that are not meant to be together in a way. So this idea of tiling and putting things that have different shapes and cover space evenly. This was one of the motivations of my, my future work. So, uh, just for the sake of discussion, I wanted to show you my very first composition. Thank you. Okay. Um, then, um, you know, I grew up, I was at this conservatory, as Greg mentioned, and I was studying computer music with this person, Eugenio Giordani. Uh, Eugenio uh, was a genius. In fact, we, were, we used to say Eugenio Giordani, and it means Giordani is a genius. And was a composer and an engineer. So for the first time, I met someone that was actually able to write code and compose music at the same time. It was kind of a revelation for me. I was not alone, right? I wanted to do that, and other people were, could do that. Uh, he taught me everything about computer music. And I'd like to play, so he passed away uh, last year for COVID. He, he got COVID and, and passed away. So I'd like to uh, to play a, a, a few uh, min few seconds of a piece of Eugenio called Solaria. This was the fir very first piece for computer generated sounds that I've ever heard heard when I was a kid, and this was a, a big epiphany for me. Like I understood that we could actually make sound with computers and make sounds that sound like Beethoven and not like just crap sounds as we played with the Commodore. So it was kind of a a point where I actually realized that we can actually express ourselves with this type of sounds that are not using instruments, but new instruments, in this case, the computer. Let, let me play a few seconds of this piece. This piece is called uh, Solaria.
So for, for some reasons that I don't even know, I don't understand even today, this music, it's very close for me to the very first 30 seconds of Beethoven symphony. Like these are the same type of attitude for sound. It's something that relates to timbre more than other parameters. And so I wanted to know more. I, and that, so I, I started studying this technology in order to be able to express myself using this technology. By the way, this piece has been composed using, some, uh, using something called granular synthesis, is a way to make sounds by putting together small grains of sound. You hear that here in the... These small events, right? So if you can control the texture, the density, the distribution. It's kind of a probabilistic approach to sound. And it's a very interesting way. By the way, this technique has been uh, 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 an important technique for uh, sound design in the last 20 years. For like for movies, for example, many sound effects have been designed using this type of technique. So let me go back to my slides. So Arjani was a, 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 a capital figure for, for, my, for my work. And then, um, you know, um, at some point, I wanted to uh, be able to develop new ideas and new instruments to make these new sounds. I would say that this revelation for me was uh, um, a kind of a, a shift from something that were, was like symbolic to something that was more perceptual. Like, for example, I, I realized how melodies actually for me were not really the thing. I was interested in streams, like how we have streams or layers of sounds together and how rhythm was not really the thing for me and I was, in, was more interested in density, like how can we control the density of, of a process. And then harmony or chords were actually a kind of a short uh, uh, description of something that I would define today texture or, or color or timbre in general. So generally speaking, I would say that I, I was more interested in passing from symbols that you learn in, at school, like harmony, chord, melody, rhythms, or pitches, to sounds that you actually are more related to perception. And so my question became at that point, then if Beethoven was thinking in notes and thinking in instruments and thinking in, in chords or harmonies, can we actually think in sounds? Can we compose and use sounds as the primary object of our creative model? And this was, this is the question that informs my research today. Can we think in sounds? And generalizing, what is the mental model that an artist uses during the creative process? And eventually, can we use mathematics to model, support, or discover this mental model? Is there a way to connect a, formal, a formalized language such as mathematics to this kind of creative uh, uh, you know, effort that you, you do when you create music or create images or you, or, or you do your own art? So for me, the question is about sounds. Like, I realized how I'm interested in using sound when I think, and I do think using sounds. And so the question is, can we use computers and other type of technologies or formalized languages to support this type of thinking in order to either speed up or you know, discover new ideas, basically. And this is basically the space in which I am today. At Sanmat, uh, let's say that the work is about uh, how can we invent new sounds using technology to make new music. And this actually is a kind of a feedback loop between the three things. And then everything goes, uh, there is no real separation between the things for me. So mathematics and music creation became a single kind of language for me. And I tried to stay in this kind of space. Okay? So uh, to use a metaphor, I would say, uh, if we think that music is like the sea, we can think there is a type of music that is music with sounds. That is a music based on uh, symbols like chords, melodies. This would be the second half of Beethoven, right? Tiram, param, param. But at the same time, there is a music within sound. That is a music in which you compose the sound itself, the timbre. You, it's not a side effect of the chord. It's the primary aim composing the sound. I compose the sound from within. In other words, this engages uh, two different type of uh, processes. One is that you use some sort of algebra of quantities when you use uh, symbols. Like I, I have a chord, I want to transpose the chord, multiply the chord by, by a rhythm by another value and increase the scale or something like that. So you use quantities and you make an algebra of that quantities, of those quantities. 
Whereas when you use, when you compose music within sound, you want to define the timbre space and it's more analyzing the qualities of the sound. So you actually are interested in, in finding new um, perceptual qualities of a sound. Well, to be honest, I think perceptions, uh, perception needs both. So that's why Beethoven is Beethoven, right? So he was aware in a, in a sense that both the timbre space, the space of sounds, the space of perception, and the space of chords, harmony, and uh, rhythms is actually connected. And these two spaces, sorry, are connected. And you want to go from one to the other continuously. So in other words, I would say that uh, a composer could find their own space in these kind of, you know, C. Either you stay on the symbolic level or you go on the timbre level, or you find a position in between the two. And I can and will mention a few composers that are actually either in one case or the other in some specific space. And I would say that in, in, in the history of music, we always had this kind of dualities in, in history. So we had couples of composers that were actually either more on symbols or more on sounds, on timbres. This was true from Bach and Handel, for example, to Mozart and Beethoven, and to Boulez and Grise. So in a, in a sense, this is a trend. And uh, when you are a composer, you want to understand where you are. So this, my, my question was then, where is my place here in this sea? Uh, where, where do I stand? Well, the, the short answer is, um, I don't know. OK, so that, that's where I, where I was at. But in order to give you some examples of my work, uh, um, after uh, uh, understanding this idea of new sounds, I started composing them and putting them together in order to have new music. So I'd like to discuss maybe two or three projects of, uh, that I, that I uh, created in the last few years um, uh, in which these, all these dimensions actually work together uh, to make music, both the technological dimension, the mathematical dimension, and the artistic dimension, in a sense. The first piece I'd like to discuss is the one that Greg mentioned too, uh, Reflet de l'Ombre. This was a large production for orchestra and live electronics. Uh, it's been a co-production from by IRCAM and Radio France uh, and had a, like a very long production period, mostly quite, well, almost two years of production. And this was a piece for um, 130 musicians on the stage and uh, 3D audio on three levels. So the Salle Playel, that is the place where the, play, the piece has been play, played, had three, you know, three kind of levels. And so we had to make three times a 3D space. So it was a nightmare of cables, so to speak. And in this piece, I composed a piece using the technology that it, I developed during my PhD in math. So this was the official moment in which these two careers somehow met. And, um, for me, it was important because I, I realized that, in fact, you cannot find your own space and define yourself in a way that is unique. And you're, you can do, uh, basically, you can, you can find your voice. This was my way to find my own voice, in a sense. Um, so um, let me give you an example of this piece. Um, I, uh, so to me, this piece was what I would call composing within sound. So this, the second kind of you know, type of, of composition. And you see here a sort of a dream versus reality type of thing. On the left, you see the sketches that I would uh, jot down on a page uh, to uh, design the timbre of this music. And then on the right, oh, sorry, on the left, <laughs> no, on the right, you see uh, the real page, the, the thing that uh, finally became the piece. Uh, between the two, there are like uh, uh, six months of work or something. And, and I actually developed tools to go from this stage to the other stage. And that's what I would call computer assisted composition or computer assisted creation. I developed a number of tools that would help me to speed up the process so that I would actually focus more on the musical level and less on the technical level and, and, and you know, uh, automating what, whatever I could uh, in order to speed up this kind of process. So from abstract ideas to real notes to be played by real people. Uh, let me give you an example. I, 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 I tried to pull up this thing uh, this morning to see if it works because now it's quite some time. Uh, let me see if I can find it, okay? Uh, so that's now, that will be the geeky section of the talk, okay? So give, 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 give it a second. Uh, yes. 
So I, I go to the folder in which I have a number of compositions. Uh, here we go. Uh, so uh, this is a set of tools that I developed for the piece. Uh, one is called Gen Diets. And you give it a number of uh, a set of numbers that corresponds to pitches, and it does a number of things. So it generates matrices and uh, connections and synthesizes something that is corresponding to this type of thing. And then, you, in fact, it generates graphs of the harmonic layout of the piece. So this is automatically generated, and it was uh, used during the compositional stage to drive the uh, harmonic uh, um, reasoning of the piece and actually is connected to the rhythm in a way. So I have, I have I made some sort of connections. And so if you go back to the slide here, you see that these uh, uh, P fields, P25, P whatever, they correspond to these boxes in the graph. So I would actually connect these two things in a kind of formal way. So this tool was uh, an automation. So I, I knew what to do. It took too much time, so I wanted to automate that. That was the, the kind of the answer. Okay, so again, the question was musical. I, I knew what to want to do. I need to find the model. In that case, it was kind of a dyadic division of pitches, and then I, I implemented that using computer computers to make this process uh, quick. Um, I guess we can play uh, maybe a, a small section of the piece. Okay, if it's that okay for you. Um, um, let's see. Okay, so. Um, what we hear, what we will hear is, so the piece was for orchestra and live electronics and the live electronics was listening to the orchestra and then reacting to the orchestra. So in the section we will play here will be the reaction of the electronics. So you will have the first half that is still the orchestra and the second half that is what the electronic, so to speak, learned and then reacted to. Um, by the way, I, I do something here that is a, a, a sort of orchestral version of a acoustic paradox called the shepherd glissando. It's an infinite type of glissando that you cannot, can you actually create using computers, but not for real using instruments. But I try to do that using the orchestra. So we, you will have this kind of feeling of uh, an infinite glissando. I hope so.
Thank you. Thank you. So uh, in, in the second half of this recording, you, you have a sort of real shepherd glissando. And this is, has been generated by the electronics after listening to this kind of fake orchestral version of the shepherd glissando. This was using something that is called the sound type. Uh, the sound type is something I developed during the, the, the PhD and has been used as a tool at ILCOM for a number of years for other musical productions and is basically meant to learn. It was one of you know, my first experiences with machine learning for sound and creation. And it was uh, 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 an important project for me. Uh, let me um, show you another piece of mine uh, called Stade d'Ombre, Stade de Lumière. Uh, there is a piece for large ensemble in this case, in which I used uh, a very different strategy to compose the piece. So it's a few years later. Um, and the idea is that I wanted to uh, use a computer to help me orchestrate. So instead of uh, finding the orchestration by myself, I would give a system um, a sound called the target sound, and the system would find the orchestral equivalent of that sound. What you see here is my project, again, the abstract version of the piece. And then these sounds, these sonograms that you see on the left are actually the real sounds that came out after the performance. So just to show you that there was a clear connection between my idea that was kind of very abstract and the final sound that came out of the piece. How did I do that? Well, um, I use, a, uh, so um, I developed a software uh, called Orchidea that I will show you in a minute, uh, the, uh, the, 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 that is able to help you orchestrating. And the way it works is that you give it a sound and you find the orchestral equivalent of that sound is a kind of a combinatorial uh, problem under constraints. So technically speaking, and the way it works is that let me give you an example of how it works. So it, the software is implemented as a package for Max MSP. That is a software for music and sound creation. So it's a kind of a subset of these of this software. And you can still use and download it today is, is uh, currently uh, developed. There is a community behind this software. It's a number of composers and researchers that use the software also for pedagogy. So they is, is used to teach orchestration actually. And let me give you an example, okay, of how it works. And then I, I will show you this piece, uh, Stade Donc, how I use the software for myself. The idea is that you want to help, well, some help in uh, uh, orchestrating a, a given sound. So how did I use this software for myself? So I decided to take uh, the sound of a bell, orchestrate the sound of a bell, and then compose a piece with that sound. Uh, by the way, this, this piece is made by, in, uh, by seven sections. Each section has a different target sound. So we'll just hear now the first, very first section for two minutes. And I play the original sound one of the possible orchestrations that Orchidea generated, and then the way I use the orchestration for real in a piece, so we'll play the recording of the real performance of the piece. So this, the sound is just this one. It's a bell. So Orchidea can generate a number of solutions. I, I just play one random solution here. In this case, you see that the timbre is quite okay, not the best, but you know, that's what I chose when I wanted to compose the piece for some reasons. And so what did I do with that sound? I composed these sections here.
Okay, so uh, I think this illustrates something that's very important for me. Uh, all the technology you can develop or the uh, support you can get from a machine is just a poetic inspiration for your work. So it's not composing for you. I'm not using computers to compose for me. I'm using computers to get some inspiration and then use this inspiration to make my own music. So in other words, there is a kind of a detachment between the uh, technical outcomes of a system that I develop for music making and the way I use it for creating my music. So my music is not my system. They are, they are not the same thing. That's, I think it's an important a distinction that I want to point out because it's um, easy today to get confused and then you have so many things that you can use for making sounds, uh, but there's no way that these things can compose for you. So your voice is unique and you need to actually use the things that you have to build your voice, not the other one, not adapt your voice to the tools. And that's kind of a, a tricky problem. Sometimes when a tool is too powerful, you have no space. When it's not powerful enough, you have no use. So um, I guess it's not easy to design something that is usable enough, but open enough to leave some space for creation. So I, I think these are the center of my research too, like how you design tools for supporting music creation. Let me go to the last uh, section of my talk. There is also new instruments. So uh, at the beginning, uh, I was talking about new sounds, like these sounds that come out from uh, systems such as a computer that you didn't, I didn't even imagine when I was a kid was possible. And then uh, you can make new music, meaning uh, something that is a combination of new sounds that creates some sort of unique way for you to express yourself. But finally, you can actually go even uh, further down the line and say, you know what, I even designed my own instruments and I want now to make new music and new sounds using new instruments. So let me give you an example of these of this practice too. I developed something called physical inspired synthesis. Uh, this is a kind of, it's a strange name to say that I want to make a, I have a system that creates sounds that are not real, but they could be real, like are real enough, so to speak, or plausible enough. They sound like real instruments, but they are not real instruments. That was kind of the, the original idea. And it, it gives some space for invention because you have now the sound of a piano that can last for like 20 minutes or the sound of a bass drum that is like pitched like a, 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 a tiny, teeny wine glass or something. So there is a space for um, invention because you see a body, a physical body that is as a strange sound. So associated to that. So this kind of discrepancy between the sound and the source would actually generate interest in, 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 in music. The way it works is that you have a sensor that you place on a physical instrument. For example, imagine a bass drum. You do some analysis on this sound and you enjoy it some sounds, but the sounds are injected back into the instrument. So there is a couple of um, uh, objects. One is called the sensor or the uh, piezo microphone, and the other one is tra the transducer. So there is a, an object that vibrates and is actually attached to the instrument itself. So both, uh, both the sensor and the, and, and the transducers are placed on the same instrument. And in between, there's some sort of analysis and synthesis that I perform. Just to give you a hint of what happens, there is some sort of an, uh, um, um, understanding of what's going on and 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 this is mapped onto some musical parameters in this case we see a kind of a low pitch gesture and a high pitch gesture that becomes two different notes but this is just an example of course you can map this information in any way you want and i'll show you what i do actually with these type of things so this is at the center of uh, one uh, important work of mine that is uh, le, uh, it's a cycle of pieces called les espaces physiques it is a piece for augmented percussions. And when I say augmented, I mean that these percussions actually have sensors and transducers and they are wired together and they actually are connected. So a number of percussions become a single instrument that is connected together. Uh, I was, I mean, the, the, the original idea was that I didn't like these, uh, this connection between the instruments on the stage and the sounds of the electronics that was coming from the loudspeakers. Like this piece at Salpleyel, had a number of loudspeakers on the audience, but the orchestra was still on the stage. So they, they were not really connected. So I wanted to preserve this kind of global space by the electronics, but also preserve the local space of the orchestra or the instruments. So what I decided to do was to put the electronics inside the instruments and the instruments around the audience. That's the idea of 
instrumental inversion, what they call instrumental inversion. I, I designed a, a number of pieces. There are four pieces in this cycle. All, only three of them have been performed to, uh, for the moment. The last one will be performed in May in Italy next year. And uh, let me give you a, a quick overview of the three pieces. Um, uh, one is called Inside Out. That's the idea. You put the intertracks inside, and then you put the, uh, the instruments out somehow. And this has been uh, for, it's for four percussionists with augmented percussions that are around the audience. And this has been performed in Paris in 2017. Um, um, I, um, I, I want to give you an example of, um, so uh, at the time I was calling these instruments smart percussions and I felt stupid doing that, right? So it, uh, there, is, there is kind of a, a strange thing that when you compose for an instrument, you usually know the instrument. Suppose I want to compose for piano, I actually know the piano and then, I, sorry, I compose for it. But in this case, I was composing at the same time both the music and the instrument. So you feel right, it, it's very difficult to, be creative in, when you don't even know what are the possibilities of the thing that you are developing. So to just give you an, an example of this, uh, I, I want to show you uh, uh, um, uh, a very quick, simple example. Uh, I, will, I will show you how I play one instrument and this instrument is played into another one that is played into another one that is played into another one that is played back in the same instrument to make a feedback loop. So this would generate a, a new sound that is uh, not really any of the instruments uh, that you have uh, that you are playing. So in this case, I'm playing a bass drum, and the bass drum is played inside a metal plate. The metal plate is played inside the tam tam, and the tam tam is played inside the piano, and the piano is played back inside the bass drum. So when you change the dynamics, you change the timbre of the instrument. So this is basically a feedback effect or a Larsen effect, if you are familiar with this uh, effect. When you put a microphone close to a loudspeaker, you get this kind of whistle, right? But you can control it and you can tune it and make music with that. This was the principle behind this, this piece. Uh, the second piece is called Core. Core is uh, for six percussionists around the audience. And in this case, and I, I mentioned that because it, it would be uh, some sort of uh, consideration I want to do at the end of the talk, the space was an essential component of the piece. The piece has been performed in a hangar, a very large space, and the musicians were like 50 meters apart. So it took like a few seconds to understand your action. So you play your own instruments. This instrument is played in another uh, location of the space that is pretty far away. And then at the same time, the other person is, play, is, is playing their own instrument and this creates some sort of feedback. So the space is essential when you create music. You need, always need to take into account the space of your music. I will uh, comment on that later on. So again, I start from a kind of a abstract representation of this, of this piece. You see here how I was imagining at the time these, the form of the piece. You see this kind of figure in which you see the things connected together. This would be a feedback kind of effect. And then let's play uh, a, a few uh, minutes of this piece. Uh, this is a performance that has been, uh, this, this happened last month in Montreal uh, by uh, an ensemble called the Six Room, Six Percussions.
Okay. Thank you. So uh, this uh, piece um, played uh, when you are in the same space as a very different effect. Is it kind of a very physical experience? You have these kind of vibrations around you, and you feel inside an instrument. So it's it's a very uh, in fact the, the cycle is called les espaces physiques. You need to experience that in the place and in the moment where the piece is performed. So you cannot really go on YouTube. You can actually go, but you the, the, the feeling is not the same. And this brings me to the most important point of the context. And this is the end of my talk. So there is another piece called Dendrum that is um, for two instruments also played and part of the cycle, but I, I will not talk about that. Let me try to make some conclusions here. I don't even know if there are conclusions. I'd like to define two things, okay? So this experience with these aug augmented or smart instruments made me, made me understand that the context is everything. There is no music without space. You have no sound where there is no space. So you need to compose for the space and the time. You have no choice than being in a context and understanding your actions are actually determined by the context. So you, you, you compose a piece for a specific venue or for a specific time in a specific moment to be played at that time. And if you want to listen to this piece, you need to go there and experience the piece, not to go online and experience the piece online. This is a very important difference between before and after electricity. When you started uh, being able to reproduce music indefinitely at a different level, loudness than the original one, like you could hear this Beethoven symphony very soft, even if it, was suppo it is supposed to be played very loud, and you can play it without having an orchestra in front of you, that makes a sort of uh, 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 disconnection between the sound and the source. And Unfortunately, today, most of our acoustic experience is re relies on not having the source in front of us. So we mostly use, uh, listen to music using headphones or loudspeakers and on YouTube or iTunes. We don't go to the concert that often. Like I would say in my case, it would be like 90% on YouTube and 10% of the concert or something like that. That's not right. We hear in a different way and so we speak in a different way. And that affects very much our perception of the world in an acoustic sense. This brings me to two concepts that I'd like to propose today. One is called musica ic et nunc. That means music now and here. Uh, and I would define that as the act of composing, taking into account space and time. So you can compose not only the notes, you also compose the venue and you compose the moment. You compose everything and everything is part of the score. I'll give you two examples of these and I, I, I encourage you to go online and check for this, for this music. Paulino Oliveros uh, was a composer that was active in the Bay Area and he was used to compose music for cisterns, like very large tubes of, you know, for water that were, uh, you know, uh, hanging uh, empty in, 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 in some countries. And these uh, cisterns have a specific feature. So they have a reverberation tail of more than 40 seconds. So if you do that, in, inside that, you get 40 seconds, the sound repeating itself. So you need to compose, keeping in mind there is a polyphony generated by the space. Each time you do something, you will have something from that has been played 40 seconds earlier. So you need to compose using the, the space as a parameter for your score. This also means that you cannot play these pieces here because that makes no sense. They are supposed to be played in that cistern. And so they have this specific long reverberation tail. And if you uh, remove the context, this music has no meaning. Walter Branchi is an Italian composer and, and, and gardener, as he defines it himself. And he composes, uh, he composes a piece called Intero, that means whole in Italian. And this piece is made by a single note a3 that is meant to be played once in a single place. So it's basically his whole life is composing a single note to be played once in a single place. And uh, this place is his garden actually in Rome. Have been there. So this is a, a, a lifelong composition that he composes little by little, but it's a single unified piece. So if you want to experience this piece, or at least the section of the piece that is now on, so to speak, you need to go there to his garden, sit and wait. And what happens is that you hear the garden, like the birds, the river, 
And then at some point, you hear some sounds, and these are clear notes, a single A. And then this note becomes louder, more evident, and then at some point, it fades out again, and you hear the gutter again. The only meaning is that you use the note as a background for the garden and you realize the context where you are. So the context becomes the music. In this case, it's an extreme uh, provocation. Like this music is just about not having any music, just about being in the present, just about listening to the world around you now in this specific moment. So this is a kind of a very interesting approach for me. It's um, not on in the top 10 in iTunes, I suppose, but uh, this is a very interesting uh, conceptual interpretation of what means uh, making something for now and here, musica ik et nu. This relates to the second concept that I'd like to uh, present that is uh, I call sonic grounding. That is a therapeutic technique that involves doing activities that reconnect you to your sounds. So uh, our body produces sounds we have voice, we have, you know, any type of sounds. So we need to know well the sounds we produce. This kind of reconnection is an essential uh, uh, um, uh, activity for me in order to be creative because I think in sounds. So I need to know what are the sounds that my body can produce. And I have a number of techniques to, uh, to uh, uh, do sonic grounding. Uh, I use usually my voice and I do that these type of uh, techniques, each time I have to do something that is creative in a way and involves sound. Um, for example, before this talk, I was grounding myself using my voice. I will not demonstrate that now, <laughs> but I will give you an example of uh, what is sounding grounding for me. And I will give this example using a composition of mine, so the last one, that is a short one. Um, this piece um, is called uh, Ali Oscillano in Fioco Cielo. Uh, I really don't know how to translate that in English, Greg. I think wings oscillates in a weak sky or something like that okay um and this is a, 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 a some from a poem by Salvatore Quasimodo, Quasimodo and this is a story of a, of a fall so Ali oscillan in fioco cielo something starts in the sky and then the last last verse is a giorni una maceria and the days ruins so it's really grounding down to the floor is the story of a fall so I, I use this, this, uh, this small poem to compose a piece for a madrigal for four voices, five voices, sorry. And this was an extremely important moment for, for me in my life. I was grounding there. This was kind of a, a moment in which I, I was down and I just wanted to come up again. And so let me play this piece and this will actually conclude my talk.
Thank you very much. Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We Okay. I don't know if you have any questions for us. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Are there any questions on Zoom? Okay, uh, let's start there. I'll give you a microphone. Um, so Valerie asks, if a piece is performed in more than one location, do you make adjustments because the contexts differ? Thank you for the question. Uh, these are a very important question. Um, these piece that you uh, just saw, Kore, for six percussionists, um, has been played uh, twice for the moment. One, the first time was in this big hangar in Milano, and then the second time was in Montreal in a very uh, uh, technologically advanced uh, place called the Kermit. Um, there is nothing in common between these two places, and so this required an extensive work of adaptation to the score, the technology, and the practice of the piece. So there is a, a, an essential part of my work that is being there to deliver my music. So the score is not my music, the performance is. So in other words, at the, at the moment, I don't know how to do to detach from my music. I need to be there and help the musicians to perform the piece. Uh, and so I'm somehow part of my work. Um, I'm looking for better ideas, but at the moment, that's what I do. So I basically redo the thing from scratch every time. Yes. There's one other question from Vincent. Dr. Cella, I would like to know if you plan on using the computer again in your music and what you think are the scientific challenges for making music more kick and in the future. Many thanks for the great talk. Thank you, thank you so much. So um, yes, I do plan to use the computers. I never stopped actually. So uh, as, as I mentioned, I composed this piece when I was six and I wrote this code for the Commodore 64 when I was six. So I never stopped since then. So I, I don't see myself uh, changing that much. So I'd like, uh, I'd like to continue, but it is true that uh, the perception I have of technology is changing very much the more I go on in my life. At the beginning, I, I, I thought it was an essential part and it's, it's becoming less essential. It's becoming more inspirational, so to speak. I use not really the outcomes, I use the process. In other words, today I, I showed you what I do for composing this piece like Stade d'Ombre using Orchidea, but this, not meant to be said is some sort of private thing that I do in order to be able to compose the piece. And it does need, the audience does need to know. The piece speaks for itself. I mean, I wish it could speak for itself. So I don't, I don't think uh, as to, to, about technology anymore as an essential tool is more an inspirational tool for the moment. And I'm looking forward to see how this will affect my music I get new in, in, in the future. Thank you. All right, yes, go ahead. Thanks for those questions, Jimmy. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, so in the past weeks of this class, we've learned about like finding creativity within blank space and like working with limitations. So do you have any thoughts on like the importance of blank space or I guess in this case silence in like music composition and have you faced any challenges or limitations that ended up supporting your creative process? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, limitation and resources are an essential part of the creative process. I agree. Um, the first piece called Inside Out that I didn't play here was using a specific device developed uh, by IRCAM uh, called the Koala. So it's a very you know complicated, technologically advanced thing to make these kind of resonances in the instrument. Then the Koala died, importantly. So between the first and the second performance of the piece, we had no more of the technology. And this made me thinking uh, that we need to find a solution to keep the piece alive despite the technology. So use the same, convey the same poetic ideas with more limitations. Limitations are a mean to achieve something in, 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 creative, in, in the creative process most often than not. I like working with extreme uh, uh, expanded technologies like this piece uh, for like 3D audio layers and a number of speakers and, and, and uh, very complicated technology. But at the same time, I like using very little technology to find new ideas for my inspiration. And uh, for example, this piece that I didn't play, Dendrum, is the third of this cycle and comes after the other two that were uh, even having new devices developed for them. 
but this piece only uses guitar pedals. So I, I oversimplified the process, I streamlined the process as much as I could, and I finally did the piece with four guitar pedals that you can buy on Amazon for $100. So the idea was that I realized, I think in this cycle of uh, four pieces, that the technology is not the poetic of the piece. The piece is the poetic of the piece. The technology is just some support, inspirational support that I use to convey this idea of instrumental inversion to have this kind of embedding space in which you feel the source, but you are you feel immersed, but it's just a me. And the, the, the real point is the music. So I, again, I would say, I hope, I really hope that my music speaks for itself. I don't need to speak about my music or explain the music of the technology. I actually want the technology to be hidden. I don't want you to realize that there is something going on while you hear this piece. I just, because this would be not a, 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 an aesthetic experience, not a, an it, it, was, it would be an analytic experience. We would be analyzing my music, not experiencing my music. And that's not, it's a no-go. So if you want to uh, create a connection on a, on a kind of a, a intimate and poetic level, you need to focus not on the technology. The technology should be hidden behind the poetics. That's the, the, basically the, the idea for me. There was an aspect to the question about silence and that I thought was intriguing. And maybe you can uh, address that as well. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, well, um, I would say that uh, one way to think about music is a space in which you have some limits. Uh, this space, uh, in fact, I, I, I oftentimes think about music as a topology. There are different spaces in music. You know, we, we are, I already touched on the fact that without a physical space or a, a so-called projective space, there is no sound at all. So you need the space to have a sound. But at the same time, music has different type of spaces. One is called the inner space, so the timbre, and then the outer space is the form. That's how I define my own topology. So these, the limits of this space are, in my opinion, sound, sorry, noise and silence. So there is some creative uh, uh, work that you can do at, at the limit of the noise kind of um, region and something that you can do at the limit of the silence or silent region. There are composers that actually focus their own works on these two levels, like Lachenmann is a German composer, works mostly on noise, but Sciarino, an Italian composer, works mostly on silence. And so many other composers uh, find their own space in this kind of, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, separation between science and, and silence and, and, and noise. In my personal experience, I'm looking uh, more and more towards silence. I guess I'm, I'm aiming at the, at shut up, okay, that's the point. Thank you. Yeah, we got a microphone. I really enjoyed your lecture. I thought there was like a nice mix of like humanism and technology. Um, my question is more about like visuals and how you use um, drawing um, and like computer generated models to create. There's just so many strong visuals in your project. Uh, in your in presentation. These types of yeah, like how do you use like, it, there's obviously like a human hand component and then how does that transfer like how does the humanness transfer into technology or how do you use drawings and visuals in your in your work or painting? Well, um, I don't think there is a single answer for, so uh, probably every piece is different. Um, the, sh the short answer would be, I think in sounds, then I make a, a visual representation of these sounds in time. That would be composing for me. Composing means to uh, uh, lay out sounds in time. And this is a very abstract representation, I agree, that I, I can only de uh, decode in a sense, and I only know what this means. But then there is a number of uh, uh, translations, so to speak, from this stage to the final uh, piece. And uh, the, the interesting thing, uh, I didn't really touch, so my mathematical work is about representations. I don't think I can, I, I, I'm not sure if we have time here, but uh, this, this question you ask is at the center of my work as like my scientific work. And let me let me show you one single slide. Maybe this could be helpful. Yes, this one. Um, music information can be thought of as multiple levels together. One is the level of signals. This is like the oscillating sounds, but this is somehow uh, created by you know 
some other levels that are, for example, the score. The score is uh, a symbolic representation of signals, but the score itself is a sort of translation of the ideas that you have, these kind of pictures I do. Well, uh, it turns out that each one of these levels has different properties. Uh, for example, the speed is not the same or the dimensionality is not the same. And then you, I, I try to unify these levels using a single concept, that is the concept of representation. And uh, I look for a scalable representation that can go from the low level of signals to the high level of ideas. Uh, so the, the aim for me is to connect these, you know, these, sorry, you remember this metaphor of the C, the symbolic space with the signal space, can we connect them? Can we go from one to the other in a kind of fluid way? And that's basically the, the, at the center of my work. My scientific work. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a final question? Yes, one final question. You got it. Uh, uh, I just want to say thank you, Professor, for the talk. It really captivated my interest in a way where it's like you're able to combine math and like computer science and like music into this like new like language essentially. And uh, throughout your uh, pieces, I could visualize almost for me as if like your pieces could fit in like a video game or more so like the horror genre where it's like whether you're being in a chase scene or a boss uh, it could apply in films also and something that I wanted to ask you is have you ever considered your music to be able to be implemented in new media such as uh, games or films? Uh, short answer is no. Um, I, I didn't find yet a way to have the same type of uh, to tell the same type of story using other media than music or sound itself. So I'm not a multimedia composer. Uh, I, I definitely work on music. But I, I think that one keyword here is collaboration. I think that I, I don't want to start learning how to do visuals or to use my music for visuals, but I think this music can be uh, associated and can inspire some other artists that can do other type of, you know, uh, languages because the languages I, I, I don't know how to do anything else than sounds. That's that's my problem, okay? or my feature, I would say. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think I I, I didn't do anything like that. So, uh, but I, I agree on something. Uh, let me show you one one last thing before we close. I agree on something. Uh, no, it's not here. Sorry. I wanted to show you one thing. Uh, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> I wanted to show you one thing. Okay. Never mind. I don't remember. Yes, here we go. Hello. Maybe I can show you. Sorry. Sorry for that. Here we go. Okay. Um, I'd like to pitch something. Uh, I uh, just uh, so started a new course at Berkeley called Computational Creativity for Music and the Arts. Uh, it's a breadth requirement course, so everybody can uh, access. There are no pre requirements, so it's filling up. So feel, <laughs> hurry up if you are interested. In this course, I will try to address the questions that I also discussed in this in this talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> so. So we're at the end of our lecture series, but we're at the beginning of a lifetime of creative expression. And that feeling um, can be summed up as inspiration. And I want to thank you for giving us more inspiration and you all for giving each other so much inspiration this semester. Thank you so much and cheers and onwards. Thank you. Mike.